Okay, in the meantime, I'm gonna introduce uh, myself. Um, we're gonna give it a, another minute for everybody to join us. So uh, my name is Carlos Hernandez, and thank you for joining us for our virtual adult speaker series. Um, uh, my title is Manager in Person Community Programs here at the Exploration Place Museum and Science Center. We're located in Prince George, BC, and honored to live and work here on the traditional territory of the Clay Tene First Nations people. I would also like to thank our media sponsor, CBC Daybreak North, for supporting the series. Um, at the bottom of your screen, you should see a Q&A speech bubble. Please pose your questions there at the end of this presentation. Tonight, I would like to welcome Ian Adams. Ian Adams is a wildlife ecologist living in Cranbrook, uh, BC. He works for Wildlife Conservation Society Canada as the BC coordinator for key biodiversity areas. Ian has a wide interest in natural history of all living things and has worked on wide variety of species for tailed frogs to mule deer. Again, thank you so much for joining us. And now we'll pass things over to you, Ian. Thank you, Carlos. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. As Carlos said, I'm, I'm joining you tonight from Cranbrook, BC, in the southeast corner of the province, where I live and work on the traditional unceded territory of the Tanaka Nation in uh, Machas Tanaka. I'll go ahead and share my screen. We can start the presentation. So we'll be talking tonight on key biodiversity areas, which is pro project or process going through of mapping British Columbia's most important places for nature. A quick outline of what I'll be talking about this evening is, uh, well, first of all, a quick trip around beautiful British Columbia's biodiversity. Uh, we're now the best place on earth, more so than British, beautiful British Columbia, but uh, it is still beautiful. I'll talk about a bit about background of key biodiversity areas or KBAs as we refer to them, uh, what they are, what they are not, and uh, sort of give how that how we go through the process of uh, mapping those out. Then where are we at with that process? It's a long, it's a detailed process. It's uh, something that's taking a fair bit of time to work through. There's a lot to go through. So uh, where are we at with that and where are we headed? I'll talk a bit about why KBA. So the the reason why we're doing this, or the the some of the questions that have come up, some of the criticisms that have been been raised about the process of key biodiversity areas, and why I think in particular that uh, it's a, a very positive process to go through and has a lot of opportunities, and hopefully have some time for questions and discussions afterwards. So first of all touch back into sort of basic ecology course of what is biodiversity. Biodiversity, of course, is all species, the interactions among those species and their environment. So it's pretty much all living things. Biodiversity includes all the organisms, species, populations, and there's different levels of biodiversity that we look at that biologists recognize. There's a genetic level, so that's essentially an intraspecies, so the diversity of genes within a species and that varies among populations. There's a species diversity. And this is both in terms of what we call species richness, which is strictly the number of species that might be in an area, and the diversity of those. So how abundant is one species versus the other? And there's a bunch of mathematical equations that biologists have developed to quantify biodiversity at this level. But uh, for the most part, that's just looking at, at those, that number of species and the, and the abundance to which they occur. And there's a third level of ecosystem diversity. So this is looking at landscape differences. So differences across grasslands and forests and alpine areas and marine areas. So those are the three levels of diversity that we're looking at. KBAs is not about calculating uh, Shannon index or other mathematical evidences of biodiversity. We're looking at number of species and ecosystems and abundances that we'll get into. There's a lot of threats out there currently to biodiversity. 
main ones that have been categorized are probably not, not a surprise to anybody. Habitat loss, you can see here in the lower left picture, housing development on the outskirts of, of Kamloops in this case, that uh, takes in either forest or grassland areas. There's change in ecosystem composition. That's a decline or a loss of one species that can affect the entire ecosystem. So think of predator prey dynamics if things get out of whack a bit, out of balance, if you like. A lot of people like to talk about balance in nature. Uh, and if that gets out of, uh, out of distur gets disturbed in some way, then you can have a threat to the biodiversity and things decline. Invasive species are a major threat to biodiversity across British Columbia, across the world, really, where we as humans now move freely about the world, we can introduce new species into areas that have a large effect on the native ecosystems. And British Columbia in particular, we spend a lot of money and a lot of effort on controlling invasive species. Pollution, of course, is well known as something that can uh, affect biodiversity and be a decline through toxicity and other impacts. And the biggest one lately, of course, is climate change. A couple of pictures here. You have a screenshot from my phone from last summer of uh, seven o'clock, this time at night uh, in the end of July in our uh, now famous heat dome where it's still 40 degrees C. That is uh, fairly extensive. For, for the impacts of that time in particular were well known across the province. It leads to forest fires. Fire, of course, is a highly, is, is always been here. It's been a major part of forming our ecosystems, but the severity and the frequency and the intensity of those fires is increasing across Western North America in particular. And that climate change is rapid enough now that evolution just can't keep up and species are at risk of declining. So those are some of the threats that we're looking at that are out there to biodiversity. And part of the mission of the KBA process is to map out where those are and be able to track some of the potential losses that, that we might be facing. So let's take a quick tour around the province and look at some of the biodiversity, the richness that we have in this province, which is quite spectacular and unlike anywhere else in the country, really. So from montane forests in the mountains and the subalpine areas, inland rainforests that occur in the Kispiox area, north of Smithers and Terrace, and in my corner of the province, Nelson and the Kootenai Lake area, Boreal Mountains and Plateau areas where Prince George is located, uh, to, up into the Boreal Plains on the other side of the Rocky Mountains up towards Fort Nelson and in the northeast corner. We have the Chilcotin Plateau that's uh, a mix of grassland and open forests and closed forests and montane areas that give rise to the moves farther into the interior Douglas fir. This picture in the lower right hand corner is from outside Cranbrook here of open Douglas fir predominantly forests and ponderosa pine that were savannas. They're uh, largely fire maintained open forests. Of course, the shrub step grasslands that occur in the South Okanagan and the Thompson area around Kamloops that are quite open. So a huge variety, and this is just the interior. We move out onto the coast and we have a whole different set of ecosystems from the classic coast rainforest with the tall, massive trees of uh, Western hemlock and red cedar, Haida Gwaii, the very unique area of the archipelago off the coast with its very unique set, set of species and subspecies. We've got Gulf Islands of, with Arbutus trees and Gary Oak Meadows interspersed with those that are fire, other fire maintained species. The leeward channels of uh, inside the passage, inside passage up through the central coast and on the east side of Vancouver Island. Of course, moving farther inland into the coast mountains. I've thrown up the glass sponge reefs here because those are just phenomenal, unique maritime areas that are mostly in the Strait of Georgia, the ones that we know of, that are ancient reefs of these glass sponge, very unique types of invertebrates growing on the forest floor. Particularly interesting on the coast is the legacy of glaciers. We have a mix of areas that were glacial, and there's increasing evidence of the extensive areas that were not glacial, that were refugia through the, through the Ice Age, and what that meant for both the species that are there, uh, for the human activity as, as uh, humans came into North America 10 to 20,000 years ago. So this is 
the, the abundance of biodiversity, the abundance of, of nature that we have in the province that we're trying to get a get a, a better handle on it and map that out throughout the province. And one of the tools that biologists have for this has been that's been used for a long time is the Biogeoclimatic Ecosystem Classification System or BEC. And that was uh, a work that a, a very fellow called Vladimir Krajina, who was a Czech resistance leader in World War II. And if anybody as a complete aside here, a plug, if anyone's looking for a really interesting book, his biography by Jan Drabek called on Vladimir Krajina, I highly recommend looking it up. He had a just incredible story before he came to British Columbia as one of the Czech resistance leaders in World War II. And he developed, he was a vegetation ecologist in Czechoslovakia before he moved here. And when he was here, became a professor at UBC and he developed this Beck zone system. And it divides up the, the province into ecological divisions reflecting um, the climate, temperature, precipitation, topography, soils, the dominant vegetation types. And there's a whole suite of species and both animals and plants that are associated with each of these. And ecologists are, rely on this as almost our Bible for the way to, to look at the ecology of the province. They account for numerous ecosystem differences. And one of the take home messages, take this back to our discussion on the diversity of ecosystem and species types across the province is how colorful this map is. If you move on to the prairies, this is almost a monotone type of, of color because it's just one largely grassland ecosystem, a bit of aspen parkland before you move into the boreal. So th that we have so many different ecosystem types in such close proximity to each other because of our mount prim primarily mountainous environment makes for uh, just an incredible diversity with across the province. And we see that when we map out, when we add up the number of species that we're dealing with. So this one, I'll come touch more on key biodiversity areas and what they what I mean by eligible elements within here. But when we look at the number of elements that uh, are in the province that could become, that could be, be triggering a key biodiversity area, BC has by far the most. We're well over 900 elements, the next closest being Ontario, slightly over 800, and all the other provinces right behind. Now here notice I've, I'm referring to elements instead of species. By elements is something that uh, the BC Conservation Data Center and other biologists refer to rather than species, because when you talk about species at risk, that's at a taxonomic level of species, but we also look at things below the species level. So subspecies or varieties as they're often called in plants, discrete populations. For example, woodland caribou in British Columbia has three different types or elements within the province. We have Southern mountain caribou, we have Northern mountain caribou and boreal caribou. And all of those are types of woodland caribou, which is in itself a subspecies of the broader caribou species that occurs across the, the circumpolar areas of the world. So throughout this, I'll be talking about elements, which is really just because species doesn't really quite fit as the term that we want to talk about. So we look at that when we look at it further as endemic KBA elements. Endemic isn't really true here because they they may occur elsewhere, just not elsewhere in Canada. So there's a lot of elements that we have in BC that come up the West Coast that are in Washington, Oregon, California, or inland Northwest. Uh, but nowhere else in Canada. So British Columbia, we have 647 elements that do not occur anywhere else in the country. Ontario comes in second again, uh, in a large part because they have the Southern Ontario, the Carolinian habitat types, which gets a lot of unique species. But uh, on that, we can see that BC has just a, a wealth of very unique special species that are in our care. So why do we care about biodiversity? There's really four main reasons that we have, that I've noted here. It's sort of the intrinsic biological and economic values of biodiversity, and particularly food. On the right, I've got a series of pictures that I took last year in our garden uh, that has bees that are pollinating our raspberry plants, the, the, the 
plants, the, the berries that grew on the plants and finally pick those and come into our kitchen. So without that biodiversity, as we've all heard, particularly lately, the concern over pollinators is important and that bees are, are one of those. So they're very important for maintaining our food supply. They're important for providing us with medicines, both natural and synthetic aspects of it, and the ecological services that they provide. So we get clean air, clean water, clean air, fertile soil, disease resistance. All of these come from the diversity of species of life, of ecosystems that are out there that maintain life for all of us. The intrinsic part is also something I think that's worth us reflecting on. Over the last two years with COVID, I know for myself, the, the value and the solace that being able to get outside into nature, uh, we're very lucky in both Prince George and where I am with low population levels, being able to access areas such as Great Creek Pass here in the, in the lower left. Uh, an area just west of us here towards Nelson that uh, allow us to get out and be part of that and enjoy that, take in the biodiversity of various species and ecosystems that are around us. So from that, we bring us to what KB, key biodiversity areas are. They're sites that contribute significantly to the global persistence of biodiversity. I think that's the main Take a, that's the main point that comes out, that con contributed significantly to the global persistence of biodiversity. And it is truly a global movement. It was launched in 2016 by the IUCN and partners, including BirdLife International. Oops. And uh, they developed a standard as a result of 12 years of consultation with experts, conservation organizations, governments, academics, private sectors, consolidate criteria and methodology of how do we identify a KBA. And as tools for conservation, they add, I'm just going to go through each of these, bring them up. Uh, the main selling point of KBAs is that it's an information layer that is highly quantitative. Uh, it's not negotiated in any way. It either set, meets a set of those quantitative thresholds or it doesn't. So it's not something that we can say, well, I think this should be a KBA. We're not quite close enough. It either is or it isn't. It's an information layer. So what they are, what they are not is they don't provide any management prescription. There's no point of saying this is how you have to deal with this key biodiversity area. It offers no protection. There's no, it is not a protected area. It is strictly uh, an information of that value occurs here. There's also no impact on access to the, to the land. So just because you have a key biodiversity area doesn't mean that you can no longer go there. It is strictly, again, an information layer. The process is regionally focused. The regional coordinators, such as myself, that guide work with knowledge of landscapes, local species, ecosystems, and the network of biologists and practitioners that know that and knowledge holders that have that work. It's a very grassroots process in that way. They're identified and developed locally, but ultimately approved by a global secretariat to ensure that consistent criteria are met. Sites can be any size. We literally have them from uh, city parks in Victoria and other urban areas from the scale of maybe a couple of acres at most up to tens of thousands of square kilometers. So there's no limit either upper or lower on what a size can be. It's where the values occur. There's spatial layers associated with information that are publicly available. So all of this gets publicly noted. We're not trying to hide anything. It, also draws attention to globally and nationally unique biodiversity values. I think that's one of the big selling points as well, is that it, because it is a global initiative that a KBAs are recognized around the world. And they can feed in. Why are we doing this? It can feed into many different types of conservation and land use planning actions. They're useful for anybody who wants to, to be able to use that information of those values that are there. So in Canada was uh, one of the leading nations that first adopted the KBA practice, the KBA practice at a national level. And we developed a standard within Canada uh, with the group, some of the organizations that you see here. 
NatureServe Canada is sort of a data warehouse of ecological data. So that's uh, an organization that is big, crosses border between US and Canada, and they look, they tabulate species data, occurrences in ecosystems. Birds Canada used to be called Bird Studies Canada, uh, a group that does science on birds across the country. The IUCN, of course, the organization that I work for, which is the Wildlife Conservation Society of Canada. Various governments, Nature Conservancy of Canada is one of the, lar is the largest land conservancy, land securement secure agency in, uh, in the country, working with indigenous organizations, working with provincial territorial governments, and of course, the federal government. So this all pulls together and we have a structure, a, a steering committee and a secretary that guides our work. Here's uh, a look at where we are. When KBAs first came in, one of the lead organizations to, to, uh, to come on board with this and press for it was uh, Bird, uh, BirdLife International. And around the world, we have something that's called IBAs, or important bird areas. I'll talk a bit, about, a bit more about those in, the, in a bit. But all those IBAs, important bird areas, were brought into, were moved over into KBAs. Uh, so important bird areas became key biodiversity areas, uh, looking at more than just birds. So we have globally now well over 16,000 KBAs and counting. Uh, this is data from 2020, so there's lots more since then. Uh, those cover probably by now over 20 million square kilometers. And the map here that you're seeing of green colored areas uh, primarily is, is those IBAs and AZEs. What the heck is an AZE? Uh, AZE is Alliance for Zero Extinction. That was a group formed in 2005 identifying areas that hold the last remaining populations, of one or more species that are evaluated as endangered or critically endangered on the IUCN red list. So these are the most important, the most critically endangered species in the world. In Canada, we have two AZE sites. One is in Wood Buffalo National Park that uh, to uh, mark the where whooping cranes breed. And the other one is on Vancouver Island that uh, notes the Va Vancouver Island marmot is critically endangered and it will come up a bit later in the presentation as well. So if we look in on Canada, this is where we're at currently with our draft KBAs. And I want to stress that any of the lines that you see here are indeed draft and subject to revision and approval process. Uh, these include all of the IBAs. So we have a number of IBAs that are, are marked here. We have uh, 300 new sites that have been identified by coordinators such as myself and my provincial colleagues around the country. 450 of these sites are IBAs and AZEs, as noted, overwhelmingly important bird areas in the historical, particularly in the prairies here. These, most of these ones here is our uh, legacy important bird areas. So these are some of the areas that we see, and you can see they're from tiny dots that barely show up on the map at this scale to large areas such as the Queen Maud Gulf Bird Sanctuary up here in the Central Arctic. Zooming in a bit closer in British Columbia, the objectives for myself is to identify all the potential KBA sites in British Columbia using the set methodology that the process outlines. With that, we also want to increase knowledge and understanding of KBAs within British Columbia. So that's presentations like now, discussing it with groups. We've met with land use planners within the provincial government. We meet with Parks Canada staff and various people who are managing lands uh, on the ground, as well as public information sites such as this. And the intent of that is to make sure that KBAs are used in land management practices. And that is occurring on a daily basis. We get regular requests from federal and provincial government to uh, where we're at with the KBAs because they're very eager to have these knowledge, to have this information and use it within their own planning processes. So how do we identify KBAs? There are the, the standards that we talked about, the global and national standards outline five different criteria through which, uh, through five main criteria that uh, we can have a key biodiversity area. Those are, we'll go through each of these quickly, fairly quickly here in a bit more detail, are 
areas that have threatened biodiversity, and those are primarily listed species or ecosystems, so species or ecosystems that are considered at risk. Geographically restricted biodiversity, so these are significant portions of species or ecosystems that occur within uh, either within the, the area that we're looking at. Ecological integrity is uh, a measure of intact landscapes, so areas that have very light human impact within them. Biological processes, criterion D, are identifying large aggregations uh, such as uh, seabird aggregations on the coast or migration stopovers, uh, refugia, recruitment areas. Uh, bat hibernacula are a good example of that, uh, areas where that are critical for a species reproductive process. And the fifth one, the criterion E, is irreplaceability. That is at a global scale. It's a bit more esoteric. It's a quantitative analysis that shows uniqueness to the area. Canada and the Canadian standards, we've not adopted that as yet. We're waiting for it. To, it's a bit more applicable to, into the into tropical areas. So uh, KBAs in Canada are not looking at this irreplaceability criterion. We'll look at the other four. I've mentioned that we have these standards that uh, initially were done at the global level that outlined how what each of these criteria require and uh, a set of guidelines on how to get there. The Canadian group that came in, they've largely adopted the global standard for uh, key biodiversity areas and tweaked it just a little bit. The main, the main difference is that our national standard accepts elements to the infraspecies level. So subspecies, varieties, populations, et cetera. A global key biodiversity area only goes to the to the species level. So when you think back to Haida Gwaii, a lot of the species that are very unique to there, a lot of the elements on Haida Gwaii are actually subspecies, things like sawwet owl, uh, or a lot of the plants that occur there. They are subspecies of species of Haida ermine that are on the mainland. Uh, so they would not quantify, quant they would not reach key biodiversity standards for, at a global level, but they certainly do at a national level. There's a recognition that those are important to us as Canadians and at a national level. So we allow ourselves to, to look at the infraspecies level. The process that we go through is fairly straightforward. We identify those biodiversity elements. We identify candidate sites, so where they occur in enough abundance to, uh, to generate a key biodiversity area. We evaluate that against the criteria. Do they measure up to the thresholds that we require? We delineate or map out where the extent of that occurrence is. And then there's a very detailed proposal file, an Excel spreadsheet file that uh, requires very detailed uh, data, a lot of support in either reports or papers or uh, communications from experts that know the species or the area about how we do that. We invite reviews of people who are familiar with the area or the species, and then finally submit that both at a national secretariat and ultimately a global secretariat that uh, approves those key biodiversity areas. So it's fairly lengthy, detailed, very measured process. And a quick note on important bird areas. Uh, these were initiated in Canada in 1996, and IBAs identify, conserve, and monitor a network of sites that provide a central habitat for Canada's bird populations. That's pretty much a key biodiversity area, except it's limited to birds. So uh, making these IBAs into key biodiversity areas is pretty straightforward for the most part. We're just accepting all, all, bio, all species and elements, not just birds. There's 83 of these IBAs around BC. They're, they're supported very strongly by a network of over 50 volunteers that go out and regularly look at the birds and monitor those air sites to make sure that, to ensure that the, the species are still, the birds are still using those. So criterion A, we'll go through each of these fairly, I'll 
relatively uh, a bit more in depth than what we looked at before. These are listed species. So species that are listed as either threatened or endangered by CASIWIC. CASIWIC is the Committee on the Status of Envir Endangered Wildlife in Canada, uh, a non-governmental agency that uh, meets twice a year to assess whether species are, should be considered at risk or not. There's also IUCN listings of critically endangered, endangered, vulnerable, that are all categories that, that, qual that classify as uh, key biodiversity areas. And also NatureServe, that or data-driven organization that I mentioned, they rank species globally, nationally, and subnationally. So things that are nationally or globally listed as uh, at, at, on a scale from one to five, at one or two, which is the most at risk and those also qualify as KBA triggers. More than that though, we also need to meet certain population criteria. So just because I see uh, a, a killer whale or this blue gray tail dropper slug that occurs in Southern Vancouver Island doesn't mean it's a KBA. We need to have either 0.5 or 1% of the global or national population within that site. We also need to have something called what the, we refer to as reproductive units. So not only just there, but we need evidence that that population that is there is able to sustain itself at a certain level. So we need to have a, a, a threshold of reproductive units that is there that might be a pair of breeding birds. Uh, it could be in the case of fish, which are predominantly, uh, or most fish species, where the, the female lays the eggs and then the female uh, the males come in and fertilize those well on externally. So uh, we need documentation that those that there's suitable numbers present. So threatened biodiversity, essentially listed species. Geographically restricted species, on the other hand, can be any species. It does not have to be listed. And these are area sites that hold greater than 10% of the global or national population size. So good portion of that entire species occurs at this one area. And again, this can be city park up to a couple thousand square kilometers. So it, it is uh, fairly flexible in terms of its size. Again, we have the same requirements that needs to be documented to be present. We have a threshold of reproductive units that need to be there. Uh, so this is such the species that are, list, are restricted to a fairly relatively small area. The example here I've used is uh, Morrison Creek population of Western Brook lamprey, which is a lamprey species that occurs only in this one drainage on the outskirts of Courtney on the BC on Vancouver Island. Uh, is shown to be genetically distinct from all other Western Brook lamprey species. And note here that those two criteria that I've talked about so far, A and B, are, I looked, talked about those at a species level. They also occur for ecosystems. So sites that hold significant or national proportion of ecosystem type that is at risk, that is ranked as at risk, can also, require, can also be uh, considered a key biodiversity area. Geographically restricted ecosystems, so ones that have a very small distribution, either globally or within Canada, can also become key biodiversity areas. I've listed a number of examples here. The glass sponge reefs that we've had the picture of beforehand. Gary Oak ecosystems on southern Vancouver Island and the Gulf Islands are one. Uh, work is just beginning on those across, uh, across Canada. Uh, initially, the initial estimates of Gary Oak's ecosystems suggest that sites greater than three square kilometers are eligible to become an ecosystem, so KBA. So there's sort of, again, that quantitative aspect of how much area would meet that threshold of 5% of the ecosystem across the country. We look at uh, Criterion C, that ecological integrity. These are wholly intact ecological communities that support large scale ecological processes. Typically, these are sites that have minimal industrial footprint. In Canada, these will probably be in the northern parts of the country. Specific Criterion is still being worked out for Canada, but we expect these to be on the scale of tens of thousands of square kilometers. There's very few, as you can imagine, very few sites that are potential for this. One would be the Muskoka area in Northern BC. Another one would be quite interesting is these Pacific seamounts or hydrothermal vents that are off the coast of Vancouver Island. Uh, picture here of, of those that are 
deep sea vents that are, create very unique ecosystems. Bi biological processes. These are the aggregations of species over a season during one or more of its key life cycle stages. So uh, we have hibernacula for bats or snakes would quantify here. Uh, we would have salmon aggregations that uh, at key spawning areas, seabird aggregations either over wintering sites or while in migration stopovers. Things like that are aggregations where a number of species critical sites that are critical to the maintaining that species. Again, we do not have to be listed here. It can be any species that uh, where we have enough information to document these. So how are we doing? In BC, we currently have 177 draft KBAs. Again, the line work is subject to all approvals. About half and half of those are important bird those legacy important bird areas and 83 are new sites that we've drafted up since then. The majority of them, particularly the, the IBAs are, are on the coast area, although we're looking at increase, we're looking around at the rest of the province and trying to increase the numbers uh, and account for all the values everywhere. And the work continues to identify these and we're adding more almost daily. Uh, a note here, particularly the, the lack of IB, KBAs in the northern half of the province is something that's consistent across the province or across the country. Most countries throughout the boreal area have much less, they, there's fewer listed species uh, and things. This is also the area where that criterion C, those large intact landscapes are likely to occur. So when you look at the Muscoa Kachika up in this area, that is one area that uh, will be represented most likely by a key biodiversity area in the future. More locally to presumably people here uh, in the Prince George and Almanica areas, uh, the, some of the key biodiversity areas that we've identified to date are white sturgeon in the Nechaco River that upstream from, from Prince George. There's IBAs in the region of, that identified trumpeter swan as the trigger species, the Stuart Tachi Middle Rivers, Fraser Lake. And another site we're looking at is the ancient forest or Chanto Gududut, I mastered that. I apologize for my poor Dakesh language speaking, uh, but uh, east of Prince George, and that is look at a number of very unique lichens and uh, rare lichens that occur in there, including the smoker's lung. Uh, very lichens have the best names among all species. They're very descriptive and colorful. And here I'll say if uh, if you have ideas uh, or can. Uh, suggestions, uh, things you want to discuss or throw out and think you might have an IBA, you're certainly welcome to contact me through my email address. We'll have that at the end again too. So why KBAs? Recall that they're not an information layer. There's no management description. They offer no protection. There's no restrictions on access. We're just identifying that, but doing apparently nothing to do to protect it. There's many, species at risk land use initiatives that have come and gone in the past that have met with varying success. Land use, land, land resource management plans that around the province uh, are most of them are outdated. The Federal Species at Risk Act uh, is relatively powerful, but it's limited to federal land, except in very extreme cases. And the federal government is hesitant to step in with the powers under that act. So it has limited, uh, limited scope across the, the country. Identified Wildlife Management Strategy or IWMS is a, a program that a strategy that the provincial government has had, the BC government has had for a while. It has limited scope, uh, doesn't apply to mining ventures as in particular, and there's questions about how eff efficient it is. So is KBAs just the latest fad that's passing through uh, has been a question that we've faced from a number of people. And I think it has good reasons why it is potentially successful. Recall that they're globally recognized uh, sites based on robust data and information sources. So if the KBA is there, we know that we can back that up as being there. And the global recognition, I think, has a, has a large set. It's not just something that either a local government is, is recognizing or a provincial government is recognizing. These are th sites that can be looked at around the world. 
they're inclusive. They cover all governments. So instead of uh, LRMP, instead of being, oh, that's provincial jurisdiction or federal jurisdiction, these things cross the board for indigenous governments, federal governments, provincial, territory, regional, municipal, you name it, they all have applications within here. Anyone can nominate a KBA. So we're not listing this just to, to biologists, to myself. Anybody can do this. They're blind to land ownership. So as Sarah doesn't apply to on private land, except in some, some cases, uh, then the KBAs occur across the board. There's opportunities for businesses, including extractive resource industries that uh, might be interested in saying that, hey, we have KBAs within our tenures or on our properties, and they can be used within certification processes as, um, as a measure of protecting environment. There's direct opportunities for land securement and conservation. So the groups like Nature Conservancy Canada, the Nature Trust of British Columbia can look at KBAs and say, this is where we should be targeting our land purchases. All species and ecosystems are potentially eligible. It's not just listed species. If it is important for any species, such as those aggregations, uh, then it is potential to be listed if a large proportion of that site of that species occurs in a given area. That can become a KBA. It doesn't matter if it's listed or not. And there's no size restriction. So there's we're not limiting it to larger areas. It can be literally smaller parks. We have delineated KBAs in downtown Victoria. So why have these things then? There's broad support across the governments. I mentioned earlier that we get calls regularly from both the province, federal governments, land use planners, even and uh, local governments as to where KBAs are within the area and how can we use these. The mandate letters given out to BC's ministers in 2020 in particular, continue to work with partners to protect species at risk, work collaboratively with other ministries to protect and enhance BC's biodiversity. We're providing the backbone in order for that ministry and able to meet their mandate letter by saying this is where your biodiversity is most important. Develop invest new strategies aimed at better protecting our shared wildlife and habitat corridors, including work to implement the Together for Wildlife strategy. Very important initiative for the BC government over the last several years. Key biodiversity areas allows them to say where some of those best values are for wildlife. And it's not just the hook and bullet species that are often take up a lot of the, the focus on wildlife. As you can see, we're looking at everything from lichens to killer whales. There's a modernized land use planning process in effect for BC, where we are trying to update a lot of those LRMPs that are out of date. So uh, the, the key biodiversity areas are playing an uh, important role within that. Species at risk management in British Columbia is frankly a bit of a mess. It has been for a while. And this is one area where hopefully we can improve that and work towards a better improved species at risk management across the province. And it supports local government planning. They don't have the resources to go out and do surveys and wildlife inventories. So having uh, more robust and scientifically defendable areas for things like developmental permit areas is really gonna help localized planning, official community plans, and things like that. The federal government is very keen on their Canada Target One Challenge, protecting 25% of the land mass by 2025, 25% of marine areas by 2025. That's a massive goal, and there's not a whole lot of time left for them to do it. So they are very interested in where key biodiversity areas may occur around the, the country. We're working, developing relationships with Indigenous governments, recognizing their rights and title to their lands. Incorporating traditional knowledge and identification in KBAs is entirely appropriate. It's using that knowledge that they have of their traditional areas is very important. Things like KBAs can help support indigenous and protect conserved areas, IPCAs that are becoming more common across the country. The NGOs, the, the non-governmental organizations that I mentioned, the land securement thing, organizations like land trusts uh, are looking very closely at KBAs to help them to make decisions on their land purchases. Other groups like Canadian Parks and Wilderness Society, Wilderness Society, some of the more environmentally focused NGOs are also very keenly interested on where KBAs are in part because of the scientifically defendable and robust nature of the work that goes into to identifying them. Finally, uh, the KBA 
is uh, wholly publicly accessible. Our website here, kbacanada.org, has a map that you will see looks like this. Uh, the, the, currently, they're just dots. Only once they are formally approved at the global level does the actual line work show up there because it is subject to change. So the, the dot is essentially a centroid of each of those KBAs, and you can pull up and look at some of the information that is there. If you pull up some of these, don't have so much information tied to them. If there's certain questions that you have, you're certainly welcome to reach out to me and ask any questions and I'll answer it as best as I can. And Birds Canada is working on a great new website on this. Hopefully, I think might not be till the end of the summer, but coming sometime soon in the coming months, we'll have a refined uh, website on key biodiversity areas in Canada, where they are, where we're working on them, where we're looking at them. And uh, that will hope, hopefully be a, a great resource for teachers, for land managers, for anybody who's interested in these. But there's opportunities for input for uh, people such as yourselves. Uh, if you have ideas for potential IBAs, if you have tips on species, on site experts, people that know different that different areas, uh, we're always looking for that. We're highly, as I mentioned, we're sort of grassroots development area. I'm in Cranbrook and trying to work as, as close as I possible, work as we can with people in the area. But uh, if there's areas around Prince George that you know of that are interested, please do reach out. Uh, they can provide data. We're very data hungry because of looking at those reproductive units to look at documentation that those species are there currently. Uh, if we had seen a bird in the, in the 1990s or 1950s in the area, that doesn't cut it. We need information that they've been there sort of within the last 10 years or so in good numbers. Uh, we hold workshops where we delineate some of these line work around here. So we're using local knowledge of those to, to improve those that line work. And finally, that review process to make sure that uh, we have things right in the end. And as I mentioned before, anyone can nominate a KBA. There's uh, information on our website on how to do that, or you can talk to me if you want to take on one of these yourselves. So I want to say thank you to uh, collaborators, funders. Uh, mentioned Helen Davis in particular as consultant out of a uh, colleague in Basin of Victoria who's been helping me out with this work. She's been doing, uh, really helped us move forward in British Columbia over the last several months. The team that I work with at Wildlife Conservation Society, uh, the KBA team, including my colleagues in various other provinces, the donors contributors primarily funding this work has been the Sitka Foundation and the government of BC. Uh, so thank you very much to all of them. Uh, the email is here. And with that, I will pass it over back to Carlos and very happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ian. It was an awesome presentation. Very interesting and full of lots of interest, interesting facts. So um, now we'll have uh, between 10 to 15 minutes for questions and answers from our audience. And if you have any questions, just post them on the Q&A speech bubble on the bottom of your screen. And we'll be happy to answer them for you. So we'll have a few minutes for you to post your questions. If you have any questions about this presentation or anything in particular that you want to ask Ian, now's the time. Like in the meantime, Ian, is there any message, any anything uh, that you want to share with the, with the audience about anything particular? Oh, uh, I, I guess. Mostly if there are species, uh, making contacts with people on the ground is a key part of this process. Uh, again, I'm based in Cranbrook and BC is a large place. So uh, if there's things that, that, that you know of, areas that you know of, or species that might be listed or otherwise uh, that, uh, that, that you think are important, that could potentially be key biodiversity areas, or if you're interested more in a specific area where the key biodiversity area might help either through a local land use planning process or whatever, then uh, certainly don't hesitate to reach out to my, uh, and send an email and, and uh, I'm glad, happy to talk to folks. 
All right, thank you, Ian. Uh, we have a question from Dave uh, Lemon, and the question is, how might naturalist clubs contribute best to this initiative? That's a great question, Dave. Uh, BC Nature, the umbrella organization for naturalist clubs is uh, fairly heavily involved with this. In fact, I have a, a meeting with next next week uh, or this week with uh, folks at the executive folks with, with BC Nature um, and the person who's doing the work with the IBA work, uh, Liam Reagan is involved with BC Nature as well. So uh, I guess one of the, the main thing is is uh, knowing the people to, to reach out there. So if there's say a club that has a lot of local knowledge from from species that are in the area, uh, certainly send me an email. It's great to be in touch with and know who those people are. So if we have a question, say on that ancient forest area, east of Prince George, uh, it, it might be able to help us out and uh, find out more information. So uh, those sources on the ground with the local information are, are key. Uh, if there are sites, if you're looking at local, uh, say a species at risk, then things we rely on Conservation Data Center data. That's the organization, the, the provincial body out of based in Victoria, of course, that uh, monitors and tracks occurrences of species around the province. They're notoriously behind, uh, like the rest of us, busy, and there's a lot of work going on. So uh, quite often, data isn't as updated as it could be. So if uh, things on especially lesser known species, butterflies. Um, snails, slugs, things like that, uh, in particular, any species, uh, quite often naturalists may have more localized and better information. So uh, if there's either listed species or things that you think might, yeah, that sounds, that what I've been talking about here, that hits a, an area outside of your backyard, then uh, please do reach out. Thank you, Ian. Um, also, we have a question from Audrey Faber. And it says, thank you for an excellent talk. I was curious about your mention of inland rainforests in the Smithers area. I thought the only inland rainforest was east of Prince George. Yeah, I thought how, how we define rainforest. I, I, I think of um, the, the interior cedar hemlock biogeoclimatic zone is the, the areas that are sort of typically wetter forests, whether it technically meets uh, definition as a rainforest, might not quite do that, but uh, sort of the Kispiox area uh, it was north of the Hazeltons and things was, was what I was thinking of, uh, what I sort of think of there. It, I confess it may, it may not technically be a, a rainforest per se, um, as much as say the, the areas east of Prince George and down through the Caribou Mountains are, but they are pretty darn wet, so, and get lots of snow. Thank you. Um, we have one more question from Mike Nash. And it says, there are many bogs and wetlands in the Rocky Mountain Trench east of Prince George that apparently have great diversity and rare species that UMBC researchers are engaged with. Are you working with the UMBC researchers on these areas? Uh, it's an area that we haven't looked at that much. We did have a, the, there's the, the ancient forest, Slims Creek area that I mentioned that that we've that uh, has come up, but uh, I think we have been in touch with a couple of folks at a UNBC. I don't know a name offhand at the moment, but um, certainly I'd be interested in that. Uh, if there is a name in particular, Mike, that uh, you think that we should be uh, involved with, um, I'm going to suggest even throw it in the chat here or send me an email right away and recommendations of of, of people to talk to. Um, because that is uh, the contacts are play a large role in this, uh, and I, I think it's it, it's very helpful at, for leads like this that can lead to uh, make sure that we have everything. Darwin, actually, Darwin Coxon, that thinks uh, there that that is uh, someone yes that we have been in touch with with Dr. Coxon. He helped us out actually with the, those lichen sites. All right, and also we have uh, another question from Anonymous. Uh, do you use data collected via iNaturalist towards determining what can be classified as a KBA? 
That's a, a great question, Anonymous. Yes, thank you. Uh, and yes, we do. Um, INAT, iNaturalist data, uh, we draw in on, we use the research grade accounts. So if you're not familiar with, with iNaturalist, uh, highly encourage everyone here to, to get involved with it. Uh, locate, or when you take a picture of any species when you're out, out and about, uh, then you can upload it to iNaturalist fairly easy, either on your computer or on, on a mobile app. Uh, and uh, the other people can then weigh in and identify and agree with your identification or correct it for you. Uh, I, I love iNaturalist. I, on there on a regular basis, uh, then and it, it's a wonderful thing that the photo recognition software and algorithms they have are fantastic. I use it as, as much as a crutch to identify plants, bugs, and things that I'm not maybe not familiar with. Um, most recently, I found actually as a wildflower, uh, a, a rust, a fungus that mimics that totally changes early spring plants in my area that I didn't know about. I'd still be trying to find out this weird early blooming yellow flower that wasn't a flower at all. So um, it's it's wonderful. And yes, we do use iNaturalist. Uh, it is only the research grade level. Uh, so things that have been confirmed by someone else. So I um, encourage you to do that. And also to, uh, if you are familiar with species, to get on there and identify them becoming research grade. If I upload a picture of a bird, I get it almost immediately. Someone is on there agreeing with me or correcting me on uh, the bird identification. Lichens can sit there for years uh, in part because there aren't so many people that are very familiar with their lichens or mushrooms or other lesser known species. Uh, so if you're at all familiar with those, I encourage everyone to get online and, and, and help out with that. So yes, we do that. eBird data is much the same. Uh, it gets drawn in and, and used as well. Thank you, Anne. And that was uh, the last of our questions tonight. Um, and well, I want to thank you again, Ian Adams, for this amazing information. Great presentation. And well, I had a great time learning something new tonight. I want to great. thank our media sponsors, CBC Daybreak North, and everyone who was able to join us tonight as well. And uh, we already have our April's virtual adult speaker series ready. So just watch for updates on our social media and our website. And so you can join us for the, for the next April's uh, VAS. It's going to be on April 25th. So um, yes, just keep an eye on our updates. And well, uh, have a great night, everyone. I don't know if you want to add something else, Ian, before we go. I wonder, I'm looking at the list of attendees. Uh, Riley Pullum is, is on here. And if it is the Riley Pullum, I think it is. He was my predecessor in this position. I took over from, from Riley. Uh, he left for another position elsewhere. So I, I want to give a shout out to Riley uh, as sort of pioneered a lot of this work. And uh, what you've seen tonight is worked on, is, is built on the, the great structure that he started off with in the province. So uh, a shout out to you, Riley. Good to see you. Thanks for showing up. Thank you. And also, Anne Hogan, uh, she wants to thank you for an excellent presentation. Mike Nash, thanks. Interesting presentation. And, and yes, I mean, it was, it was a great presentation and great resources as well. Excellent. Great. And again, encourage uh, my email, iadams at wcs.org. Uh, love to hear from anybody. Um, it, it, it really helps us. So thanks. Thank you. And also last comment from Dave uh, Lemon. Um, great, will, the, will be, the presentation be available after? Fine with me, certainly. So uh, I know it's been recorded here. So uh, there's a series of, of IBA, uh, sorry, IBA, KBA presentations at our website, uh, KBA. Canada.org. Uh, there's monthly webinars that we do that look at uh, various KBA related activities uh, across the country. Um, so you, at, you can check out kbacanada.org on, on that website. Uh, there's some past, lots of past webinars and uh, you can sign up to be notified about other future KBA related webinars coming up. Right, and I just posted my, my email 
um, here on the chat box. So if you guys want, want um, the recording, I can send it to you as well. So, um, or through Ian's uh, email as well, but I can send you the, the recording. So um, yeah, my email is carlos at the expiration place.com. So feel free to send me an email so I can send you the, the recording if that's okay with you, Ian. Absolutely, sure. All right, well, uh, thank you again, everybody for attending tonight and have a great night. Thanks, Carlos. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night.